Hello and welcome to the 11th episode in the series Evolution of a Nation, a documentary series chronicling Uganda's political and economic history since 1944. I'm Bart In the previous episode, we focused on Amin's first two years in power, the expulsion of Asians, and its impact on the economy. In this episode, we take a look at the growing resentment towards the regime and the subsequent isolation by many countries. The 1972 invasion of Ugandan dissidents from Tanzania and the brutal atrocities that followed. Thanks for joining us. Much as Amin's coup had been applauded by many people, there was equally a large number of others who, right from the start, disapproved the regime. In less than one year, Amin's brutality started manifesting. To many, therefore, Idi Amin looked like a liberator. If you went to the United States, you'd find that he's revered among the blacks. Reason, many black people in America were, were fascinated by statements by Idi Amin. Africans were taken as slaves from Africa to United States of America, to other parts of the world, and now they have lost their culture. You find so many Negro in uh, United States of America, in South America, in other parts of the world. I remember talking to a number of uh, uh, African Americans in uh, the U.S. About against it, I mean, and they wondered what uh, an agent I was. They thought I was an agent of imperialism, but the same Idi Amin, within no time, started killing people, right, left, and center. Now, besides the deposed militant Obote and his cronies, other politicians and revolutionaries, mainly those that had fled the country, vowed to fight Idi Amin. Subsequently, a number of anti-Amin rebel groups were formed, the majority of whom, including Milton Obote, established bases in Tanzania. Many of the dissidents had had the advantage of going through the University of Dar es Salaam, the center of East Africa's left wing at the time, and President Julius Nyerere, who refused to recognize Amin's regime, offered them sanctuary and training facilities. Eria Kategaya was one of the young Turks who went to Dar es Salaam University and subsequently participated in pioneering the rebellion against Amin's regime. We had a lot of interaction with the liberation movement. And that one really sharpened us in reading more about the African problems, knowing people can fight uh, for their rights and succeed. We had contacts with Vietnam, Cuba, and, uh, and all the liberation movements in Mozambique, in South Africa, in Zimbabwe, in Namibia. And the Salaam at that time was really a uh, hub will make us quote and quote of liberation. I find in my paper. Augustine Ruzindana, who had just gotten himself a job as a banker in Kampala, had earlier in his student days at Nairobi University been a part of wider network of revolutionary youths. I was working in Grindley's bank. But during our time at university, we had sort of formed a network of like-minded students, those in Nairobi, those in Makerere, those in Dar es Salaam, and so on. Um, and so when the coup took place, many of us rejected the new administration. And uh, then others started talking about alternatives on how to, to fight the regime and so on. And ideas began being concretized. Uh, but when concrete plans were made about uh, alternative struggles to, uh, against the regime, uh, then I left the bank. Uh, 
Did you know Museven by that time? Yes, that, that, that was a part of the network. Okay. Uh, that was a part of the network when I remember we had had a discussion with him when we were students in Nairobi. Uh, so when the coup uh, took place, for him he ran away immediately. But all the others who were not, who didn't, then we talked among ourselves. He made contacts in Tanzania. Yeah. So the first group of those who went for training came from the people who had been uh, interacting. Yoweru Museveni subsequently organized the revolutionaries under one front that was named the Front for National Salvation, FRONASA. The idea of a front was that you are bringing people together or with or various ideologies of various uh, uh, class origins and so on. And that's why it was called uh, a front. Nachingwea, a district in southern Tanzanian Lind region, a training area for Mozambican Frelimo fighters and a staging point into Mozambique. It is here on a cashew nuts farm that Fronasa fighters trained alongside Frelimo fighters. Farm 17, Nachingwea, yeah. uh, was, was very crucial because that's where a, a, a number of our, group, our earlier groups were trained. And Nachingwea was the training, uh, the, 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 the main training area for Frelimo. And so we did our training as a part of, of Fredimo. Okay. Uh, but I remember when we were going, we passed through Mbeya and we were in an MPL camp. And uh, so it, 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 we, we, we cooperated with many other uh, liberation organizations. They uh, were very hospitable to us. Although we were trainees, but at the same time, we resided with the officers of Frelimo. And, and, uh, and, and so we were trained both as officers and, and, and as ordinary. How as big was well. the number, the first number? No, we were just six. Meanwhile, the Obote Wing had established training facilities in southern Sudan at Winy Kibul, a Sudanese army garrison with the support and backing of Khartoum government. The fighters were people mainly of Acholi and Langi ethnicities. Agri Awori was the external coordinator of the rebel group. Amin also made a bad mistake. When he took over, he went after the Langis and the, and the Acholis. He really went, he slaughtered them, wherever they were. And the few who managed to escape went across the border. They were able to assemble and cross to Owinkibu. In mid 1972, President Nimeri was briefly overthrown by communist backed insurgents. During that short time, Obote tried to establish relations with the people who had overthrown Nimeri. We were grappling at any straw that would come our way. And that's, that was a tactical error. That also made Khartoum very angry. When Nimeri was restored to power, he expelled Obote's people from Sudan. They were put on a ship at Port Sudan and shipped to Tanzania. I literally deported them with a tacit understanding of Dar es Salaam that you can put them on the ship, put them up to Tanga by road or by railway, we will find them a place to. That's why I say Nyerere was a really committed person. Very, very committed. Nobody would have done that. About how many people are there, those who, are in, who left going? Uh, could be, could have been about 500, about half a battalion. There was a problem also in Tanzania, how to accommodate these people. You know, you, you don't, where do you get a budget to support these armed people? Two, even if they are going to do any military program, they don't have any arms. You still have to supply them. That's why they were taken to this camp in uh, near Tabora. And uh, for one year, they were literally surviving on their own. I can give an example. Basilio, Basilio was just chopping firewood, making charcoal for survival. The late uh, President Okello was just selling dry fish. Life was very hard. 
So when the opportunity came to invade Uganda, there was a lot of pressure internally and externally. Externally, there was an incentive, which was a very misleading incentive to attack Uganda uh, by way of two items happening in the country. Number one, Amin had just expelled Indians from Uganda. That's 72. And people thought that would make Amin very unpopular. And there would be any innovation force would be welcome. Two, we also assumed that the British <laughs> would come to our help. It was a very short memory on our part. One year back, it was the British who helped Amin to get into power. So for us to think we'd get help from uh, uh, external sources, especially the British, was foolhardy. We came up with a very haphazardly made plan of hijacking an East African Airways plane, pick up the soldiers in Arusha, and land a commando style in Entebbe, take over Entebbe, and thereafter fight our way to Kampala. I call it foolhardy because it, the plane was uh, Boeing 737. Yeah. It was a smaller plane, yeah. taking less than 100 people. Now, for us to think that here are people who have just come out of non-activity, military <laughs> activity, with the minimum guns, they can take over now. Secondly, they had been brought by road all the way to Arusha. The plane, East African Airways, used to fly after midnight. So we arranged with some pilots, including our own, uh, whose name I don't want to say now, who was to come with the plane up to Arusha and pick up the commandos to come and invade Kampala. I mean, <laughs> uh, it was almost a, a, a laughable situation. Now, three flaws again. Number one, our people in Tanzania, especially Dar es Salaam, were talking, making calls to Kampala. We are coming, we are coming, we are coming. That's so stupid. That's spreading a military yes. secret plan. Number two, East African Airways, which had left Nairobi, last midnight flight, landed in, in Dar es Salaam, refueled. Now it's supposed to come back, as if it's coming back to, Entebbe, uh, to Nairobi, but would land in Arusha and pick up the soldiers and head to Entebbe. The pilot on his own was actually a cadet pilot. On his own, he could not land properly, jammed on the brakes on landing at Arusha, wrecking the aircraft. So that was the end of it. Fortunately, in those days, we used to have the, what you call UTC buses that used to go around East Africa. We put two bus loads with some, you know, flexibility. We were able to bring them to the border we set up a camp on the Lake Victoria and near Busia, a place called Nambali. We ourselves, by that time, had already trained substantial numbers of people. And we had a training facility in Bukoba. I came from here to our training facility in Bukoba. I crossed the lake with two students from Makerere who had... Uh, uh, who uh, we had tried to have students go and train and come back after after the long work. Uh, so when I arrived in Bukoba, I found um, Seveni and he says, "Well, the Obote people are, are staging an invasion. We don't think it will be successful, but we shall take advantage to take in our materials." He told Nyerere and Obote that ours is not an invasion. 
we have to work from within to make a, a, a regime change. You see, also Nyerere really appreciated his role, but uh, Dr. Bot insisted that no, they had to go in, they had to go and fight, they had to invade. So Seven said, okay, there's no other way. He said he had a dilemma. Because what is had started selling an idea to the Tanzanians. How can these young fellows go in the country and come out? They must be agents of a, of, of a mean. So he told us that if he had refused to come or to join the, 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 the dirty attack, invasion, Tanzania might have said, yes, these fellows have been their double Despite their unpreparedness and disagreements, the two rebel forces launched an incursion into Uganda on the 17th of September, 1972. The Obote-aligned forces entered at Mutukula with apparent intentions of capturing army outposts in Masaka. The Furunasa force which entered at Chikagati was aiming at the army outposts in Imbarara. We had two sections. M7 was the commander of our army, but he was also a commander of, of one section. I was his two, the second in command of section. Another one was commanded by Mesigwa Black, and his second in command was Vajira. Uh, and so we had our own truck, and but we had two Land Rovers full of arms. So we were actually ourselves bringing in arms. But as predicted, the attack was futile. Some of us were inside here. I remember that day when there was the attack. I was with the little Waheru. I was with the Martin Mwesiga. And by then we were doing our work of trying to organize internally, uh, filling the arms around. And then when we were on Sunday about 11 o'clock, someone said, Prepare a tactic gun. Okay. How could you? Because the country definitely, you were right, the country was totally unprepared. Yeah. The Obote force was expelled by the Malira Mechanized Regiment, while the Fronasa force was repelled by the Mbarara Simba Battalion. Uh, the plan had been to arrive in Mbarara before uh, uh, daybreak. Uh, there were delays on the way and so on, and uh, we arrived about nine. In the morning on Sunday. Yes, and, and the, by that time the barracks were alerted. We met the commanding officer towards going towards Chikagate. And um, so they were alerted, and we didn't succeed uh, and, uh, breaking into the barracks. A few mortars were placed at the, the, the mosque in Kakoba, and they were shelling inside. And, the thing ended very quickly. So how big was the, the group from, from, your, from, from NASA? It was about 27. The 27, mm. they all died? No. No, no, no. Many survived. Yeah. Mm. Many, many, many survived. Many, many are still alive, You actually. lost about... Mm. Uh, I, I think probably about half. The commanding officer of our axis in the Mbarara one was captured in, because so that's the time Obajira died, that's the time Mwesi were black died, that's the time. Mm. So what about the, the, the side of, Tanz, of the, the Obote group? Uh, most of them died or, or were captured and others were killed. Uh, but many also went back. Amin's soldiers' hunt for the guerrillas, which lasted about a week, was also joined by civilians. To many civilians, these were Tanzanian invaders who had come to disturb their peace. The entire Ambarara, Masaka and the neighboring areas were combed in search of the invaders and their collaborators. Most of the captured fighters were either killed by the mobs or taken to army units from where they were tortured before they were summarily executed. Former Minister of Internal Affairs, Bazid Bataringaya, the man who had been tasked by Obote to arrest Amin before 1971 coup was picked from his home in Kanto Jobusheni, where he had retired from politics and whisked to his execution. So he was picked right from home 
brought to military police in Barara and he was never seen again. He was arrested even people saw. Yeah, he was not seen again and they actually even his body has never. The wife was arrested later on. Amin retaliated against the attempted invasion by purging the army of Obote supporters, predominantly those from Acholi and Lango ethnic groups. Lange and Acholi soldiers were massacred in Jinja and in Barara. The failed attack also prompted Amin to task the State Research Bureau and the newly formed Public Safety Unit with an intensified search for suspected subversives. To go to Naguru, definitely wouldn't expect to go to court. You would end up there. It was competing with the much in the military police. Whoever would go to Naguru. And now they started even soldiers. Whoever they thought was against the government, or even to pay these uh, vendettas, they would go to Naguru, they pick you, beat you. That, that would be the end. It became a slaughter house. Now, in order to instill fear in anyone who was nursing subversive ideas, Amin instituted public executions by firing squads. He ordered executions of the arrested suspected collaborators of Fronasa and other dissident groups. The first public executions of 12 people sentenced to death by a special military tribunal on charges of guerrilla warfare and robbery took place simultaneously in six towns in Uganda. Now, according to tribunal ruling, each respective victim was to be executed in his home district so that everyone, including his parents, can see. In Kampala, Badru Semakula, a suspected robber, was tied to a tree and faced a 12-man firing squad before an estimated 30,000 strong people. They would announce and call people. The vehicle would pass in the town, is there people to be, robbers are going to be executed, saboteurs are going to be executed, you come. In Imbale, Tom Masawa and Sebastian Namirundu, alleged to be guerrillas, were brought to execution place, dressed only in white aprons, easy to see from a distance, and faced a firing squad that carried out the execution. In Kabale, it was Joseph Bitwari and James Karambi, alleged to have been guerrillas linked from NASA. I happened to have gone to Kabali, uh, but I did not go to the stadium, but I stood on top on the hill there, because many people stood on the hill. Then they put them in the stadium, covered the, their faces, and then fired, firing, uh, firing squad. And then the soldier dem made, a, made a sort of uh, demonstration of strength in the town, marching from one end of the town to another. People were very cold. People cried. The number of people abducted and subsequently disappeared started swelling. The victims came to include members of other ethnic groups other than their cholis and langis. Benedicto Chuanuka, who had accepted a means appointment to the post of Chief Justice, was pulled from his chambers at the High Court building by a means agents five days after the invasion and was never seen again. It was one of the terrible things because I remember I was in my office at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Kampala and all of a sudden I see people rushing, running away. You know, at that time whenever something dramatic happens, people would rush. That would happen whenever there was something yes. mysterious or something dramatic. The initiative of each party was to, to run. Then I discovered the Chief Justice had been arrested. I said, what? Yes, they've taken Chief Justice. He, I think somebody had arrested, had been arrested, and he had given bail to that person. And Amin was very upset about that. And the, he ordered the release of that person. And Kwanaka said, he has no, uh, they, but should be given bail. And with that, when, when said that, there was a conflict again there because Amin was not very happy. And then his abduction took everybody by surprise. And I remember at the time, uh, people brought so many petitions to me, 
that I should yeah, take up this case with Amin, which I did. And I said, because these are, these are letters which are being brought to me. Please, can you do something? Because it would be terrible for Chief Justice to disappear just like that. He was a very stubborn man. He would, <laughs> he would bring this information and I would just look at you with a stony face. You see? But later on, I realized that he himself had something to do with it. Uh, because as a president and commanding chief, nothing like that cannot happen and you know nothing about it. On the 11th of January, 1973, former Minister of Works in Obotewan government, Shabani Nkutu, was abducted from his office in Jinja, where he had retreated into a quiet life of private business. He was bundled into a car boot and driven away. His body was found floating in the Nile. Nkutu was the last straw, I would say. And I took it up with Amin, personally, directly challenging him about this. I said, I've been told what has happened to Nkutu at the time of his arrest. The time he was taken to the barracks, the community barracks. The time his body was in, put in the mortuary in a ginger hospital, and the time it was taken away, uh, all this, I'll tell you, I was reading all these things to him, and I, I would say I was getting more and more angry. You know, why should I be telling him about these things? And he started telling the ministers that don't, don't discuss these matters because those are security matters. Even if they pick your brother like they did mine, you don't say anything because those are military matters. The brutal terror unleashed by Idi Amin seemed initially to have worked. Most of the rebel groups kind of went underground. By mid-1973, the situation in Uganda had worsened so much that Idi Amin's regime was internationally referred to as the reign of terror. Besides, the economy was collapsing very fast. In the next episode, we look at the 1974 attempted coup by Charles Arube, Uganda hosts the OAU, the increased atrocities, including the murder of Archbishop Janan Lum, and the total collapse of the economy. Until then, thanks for watching. Le, 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 le.